Taike Hotaki. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Kalokan Christian Baptist Church online service. Hope everyone slept well last night. Um, sound, safe, and healthy. You know, this crisis has stopped us from doing so many things that are usual or normal to us. But one thing this crisis cannot stop is us worshiping the Lord, our God who is con in control of everything, even this crisis. Let me begin by reading Psalms 113, verse 2 to 4. Blessed the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. Let us pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for always being in control. Thank you for showing your love even through this crisis, Lord. Father God, help us to see the blessings over everything that's happening around us right now. Prepare our hearts and our minds as we worship you today. May our songs and worship be glorifying to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name, you give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, though blessed be your name. We are truly blessed with our Heavenly Father, who is with us through thick and thin, the giver of peace, hope, and love. When there's nothing good in me You are love, you are love On display for all to see You are light, you are light When the darkness closes in You are hope, you are hope You have covered all my sin Are peace when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, in you that has lost its Rich 
treasures of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the
Father, thank you very much for this time. Lord, thank you for this day that we could pray and worship you as one body. Lord, we thank you for last Sunday's live streaming. Our speaker was uh, Elder Chris Beltran and for our ever faithful uh, worship team. Lord, we thank you for your continued shielding and protection from COVID-19. Lord, and we uh, thank you for our sister whose uh, laptop was fixed. Lord, we thank you for Pastor Rossi for being able to start her Class 101 with some of our members and uh, for our brother's treatment and our online Sunday school, which started last Sunday. Lord, we, pray we continue to pray for our um, members' health and uh, their families, Lord. Please uh, keep them always safe and Please provide for their every need. Lord, we pray for each uh, Filipino uh, that they be law-abiding citizens, especially in this time of pandemic. 
Lord, it's really hard to be locked down, but Lord, um, may we be always be conscious of um, thinking first of others uh, before ourselves. Lord, we uh, pray for our Sunday speaker, Pastor Joselito Chua, as, she, as he uh, speaks his uh, your message for today. Lord, we also pray for the four uh, soldiers who uh, were died after the police shoot down. Lord, we pray for justice for them. And Lord, we continue to pray for the 14 fishermen missing at sea, for our Philippine economy. Uh, help, help us to be able to bounce back. And Lord, we pray for continuous food, food supply for every household, Lord. Lord, we also pray for the swine flu in China. May, be, may they be able to contain it so it won't uh, spread to become another new virus. Lord, we pray for our online connections for each member, Lord, so that we may be able to access our online worship and uh, activities in church. Lord, we also pray for uh, the career of our brothers and sisters who um, now are at home, Lord. May you give them wisdom and the knowledge on what career to, to follow and uh, what new things they can learn. Lord, we also pray for our brother whose father uh, has uh, been undergoing chemotherapy, but the doctor uh, suggested uh, to do an IV and oral chemo. Uh, please, we pray for a good family decision. At the same time, for a sister who is battling uh, breast cancer, Lord. Lord, we pray that um, you will continue to uh, guide her and uphold her in this difficult time and also pray for uh, the the people who will take care of her that they may know you as their Lord and personal Lord and Savior. Lord, we also pray for the studies of our brothers and sisters and for those who will take the board exam. Lord, we thank you for your continuous uh, support, love, and um, sustenance lord in this uh, time lord we give to you everything in jesus name we pray amen good morning church our scripture verse for this week is found at the book of judges chapter 6 verse 1 to 24. the israelites did evil in the eyes of the lord and for seven years he gave them the hands of midianites because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern people invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops of all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkey. They came up with their livestock and their tent like swarm low cost. It was impossible to count them on their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Median so it provished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Median, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out from the Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of Amorites, in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah, and belonged to Soash the Abizarite, where his son Gideon was stretching wheat in the winepress to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord. Gideon replied, But if the Lord is with us, why has all that happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us in the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Minash, and I am the least in my family. The lord replied, 
I will be with you, and you will strike down all Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he made bread without yeast, putting the meat in the basket and its broth in the pot. He brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, govern Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord, then they called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it stands in Ophra of Amirites. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are almost at our fourth month quarantine. For a lot of people, that's too long a time to be locked down. There are those of us who do get to go to work, but there are those who are 21 under and above 60 who are still prohibited from going out. And for those people in those age group, four months of lockdown is really a long time. In fact, even for us, even under GCQ, it seems like even though there's mobility, there's still that sense of kind of like feeling that we're locked down because we're still unable to do 100% all that we want to do, right? And the reason why we're still in GCQ is because there's still that unseen enemy, a very powerful unseen virus. It's hard to be quarantined, but we are doing it because of that enemy. But what if you're locked down because of a visible enemy? In fact, a far stronger and far superior enemy. This morning, we're going to look at a people who are in hiding because of an enemy that attacks them year in and year out for seven years. I'm talking about the Israelites confronting the Midianites. The Midianites have been attacking Israel for seven years, as our text, as the text we read earlier uh, reveals to us. And for those seven long years, the Midianites would attack the people every time that they would be gathering the crops for harvest. The Midianites would pounce on them and steal their crops, and this would go on year in and year out leaving them nothing to live on. Have you ever found yourself in a similar situation? You're, you find yourself caved in. You find yourself holed out in a cave, and you cry out to God for help, but it seems that your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. We do know that God cares. We do know that God intervenes. But sometimes we struggle with questions that bother us. Like, why is this virus still here, and will there ever be a vaccine that will be discovered? And you, ask, you know that God has done miracles upon miracles in the past. But what about now? Gideon, our hero for our story, was very despondent. He, was, he ended up by saying, Lord, you have, you have turned us over to our enemies. You have left us and abandoned us. And I don't know if you've ever felt that way, that the feeling that God is not there. The feeling that, as I said earlier, you pray and pray, but all your prayers are simply going, not even going through the ceiling of your roof. It could be because of unanswered prayer. But what I want you to consider this morning is that it is precisely in those places where you feel farthest from God, where you feel God so distant or absent, that is actually the place where God could actually meet with you. That is a place where you could experience the greatest degree of closeness, intimacy with Him. So where is God? Where can you find God in these circumstances? The title for today's sermon is, Where Does God Meet Us or Meet With Us? Now, isn't that supposed to be the other way around? Shouldn't it be that we are the ones who meet God or who meet with God? 
What we will discover in our text this morning is that it is actually God who initiates. God is the one who meets us in the most unlikely places, in the most unlikely circumstances. We'll look at the story of Gideon and God, how God met him and his people at the most unlikely time. We find ourselves in the, in, here in the story, our hero is in a tree uh, in Oprah, where we find our hero Gideon threshing wheat out of a wine press. Let's look at verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash, the Abizrite, where son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now what is so significant about that particular point or particular uh, part of the story? So, well, if you understand where this, the context of what is being described here, when you're threshing wheat, of course you're supposed to thresh wheat in an open field, right? You beat this. Uh, what you do is you beat the wheat, throw it in the um, first, you beat it on a big slab of rock, then you beat the wheat and throw it in the air, and the wind would blow away the chaff, and you're able to harvest the wheat, right? So you do it in an open field, so you could harvest as much as you can. But a wine press is a small confined place, a small place where just a slab of rock portioned out, where the people would put on the grapes, and the woman would dance on it and press um, and step on it so that out would flow the wine. But of course, in that confined space, you cannot wheat, or rather, you cannot harvest as much wheat as you can. The question is, why is Gideon threshing wheat in the wine press? Because he was afraid. He was hiding. He was hiding the, the, the wheat from the Midianites. Because as soon as the Midianites would see that he, he was harvesting, they would instantly pounce on him. And before he, he could even harvest the wheat, lo and behold, it will all be gone. The Midianites would have taken it from him. That, that happens to Gideon and his people for seven years, year in and year out. Look at the preceding verses. Verse 2 to verse 5 reveals to us the context which I shared earlier. It says, Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern people invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarm of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Look at that scenario. You take care of your sheep and cattle, but after a year, someone else would take it. You, you, you harvest, you plant, you harvest. Before you even get to harvest, someone else takes it by force from you. You're left with nothing. And so the Israelites were left to abject poverty because of what the Midianites, Amalekites, and other Eastern people were doing against them. And so we find our hero in this scenario. And then the angel appeared to him. At that point, the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. Verse 12, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now notice how the angel of the Lord called Gideon, a mighty warrior. Now isn't that strange? He was a farmer hiding from the enemy, from the Midianites, threshing wheat in a wine press. He was neither a warrior, nor was he mighty. He was scared, he was in hiding. And yet the angel comes to him and calls him a mighty warrior. If you were Gideon, you would say, excuse me, you might have had the wrong person here. If you want to go looking for a mighty warrior, you might go and look, for, look at him amongst the Midianites or Amalekites, but not here, and especially not among the Israelites. We're all in hiding here. But notice how Gideon responds in verse 13. But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our father told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. You see, the first and primary concern of Gideon, he did not address the issue about being called a mighty warrior. What he did address was the statement of the angel that said, the Lord is with you. Now, that is a usual greeting of an angel. You find that throughout scripture, the Lord is with you. But when you say the Lord is with you, it has to have a meaning attached to it. And that simply, the meaning simply is that the Lord is with them, that the Lord is helping them, that the Lord is guiding them, protecting them. But that is far from the situation that we find Gideon in. And so, in effect, that's exactly what Gideon was saying. How can you say that the Lord is with us? Can't you see we're in hiding here? 
Can't you see that these Amalekites and Midianites have constantly year in and year out stolen everything from us? And here you are saying the Lord is with you, right? You want to know what that feels like? Let's say that you have a garden. You work hard all, all summer long to make that garden produce abundantly. But every year, about the time that you're ready to gather the harvest, your neighbors would pounce on it and steal everything from you. Steal all your hard work, all the waiting to not because simply of your enemies. And that would happen year in and year out. If you can imagine that scenario and multiply that a hundred times, that's what you find in the, in the situation that Gideon and his people are confronted with. I think most of us can sympathize with Gideon. His people had been overrun by a foreign power. It appears that he had lost probably some of his own brothers in the struggle. He was afraid, he was dejected, he was frustrated. Suddenly this angel shows up and says, the Lord is with you. And Gideon's response was as honest as it could be. If the Lord is with us, if the Lord is with me, then why has all this happened to us? A feeling of abandonment. And sometimes we feel that way, don't you? A feeling of a certain sense of abandonment, that he has abandoned us to the mercy of nature or sickness or this pandemic or financial difficulty. And we ask ourselves, if the Lord is with me, then why are these things happening to me? You had cancer and had been spending lots of money going through chemotherapy treatment. And as you take PET scans and other tests, the test results show that the, that the tumor hasn't shrunk at all. In fact, probably for some, it has grown bigger. And you ask yourself, why are these things happening to me? Your business has been picking up and doing well at the start of 2020. And here comes COVID. And before you know it, you're already at that point where you're struggling whether to declare bankruptcy or just lay off some personnel or just simply close everything and move on. And you ask yourselves, where is God in this situation? And we put the blame on God's shoulders. And we feel that he has abandoned us. Many people felt that way in the Bible, not only Gideon. We can find Israelites when they were wandering in the wilderness. They said, better yet that we were back in Egypt. Why did you lead us here only to suffer hunger and death and thirst? Elijah also, at the time when he felt abandoned by God, that he had to flee from his life, from the wicked queen Jezebel. And he was shouting out to God. He was saying, I'm the only one left, and they're after me. I'm the only prophet left. The prophet Habakkuk expressed a similar grievance when he said, why isn't God doing anything about the wickedness of his own people? But when you look at each of these scenarios, God was there at every time. No matter how stubborn the Israelites were, God provided manna for them day in and day out. And he was constantly watching over them as well. With Elijah, right, he came through the gentle whisper and he revealed to Elijah, I have left behind 7,000 men who have not bowed their knees to Baal. To Habakkuk's question, God said, I am doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told. However, that picture is that of, a, of God using the Babylonians to discipline and punish his people. But then you said, that's a bad news. But then again, what you see there is that God is still in control. God knows the situation we are in, and God is fully in control of the situation. God was there each time. And that leads me to my first point. God meets us at the center of our woes, at the center of our suffering. Do you find it amazing that God meets Gideon right there at that point where he was hiding from the enemy? You see, that is what God does. He meets us where we are. You don't have to have a right theology of God for everything before God, encount God allows you to have an encounter with him. In fact, even at this time when we have a vague understanding of God or a distorted view of God, God meets us there at that very moment to enlighten us, to help us see who he really is. In, in troublesome situations, that's what happens. Whenever we face difficulties and sufferings, all of a sudden, our theology, our high theology, all of a sudden shrinks, and we begin to doubt the very things we believe in. At that point, God meets us at our moment of need. We meet him in humility, in prayer, in our place of deepest need. Is it possible to find God in the midst of suffering? Sometimes it's only when someone's reached the end of their ropes that they begin to cry out to God 
just like the Israelites. God will, come often, God will often come looking for you at your, lowest, at your most lowest moment. I mean, think about this scenario. Try reaching out to people as a pastor like myself. Try reaching out to people when their bank accounts are full and um, everything's, all their health is okay. When they go through blood tests, it, it comes out normal. Everyone's healthy. Kids are doing well. Business is booming. And try to approach them and tell them, can, I want to, uh, how are, you want to uh, reach out to the Lord or you want to accept the Lord into your life? Or you, even you ask them, could, could we pray together? And a lot of people would say, Bosu Yao. Okay? No need. And they see no need for the Lord during the times when everything is falling into place. But visit them at, at a hospital when they're in their deathbed. And the very same people who would reject or who would deny you the opportunity to pray for them would in fact be the ones to ask, could you pray for me? Or you come to them and approach them and say, can I pray for you? And you approach them and share to them the gospel and a lot of them would openly accept, openly receive the beautiful, wonderful gift of salvation through Christ at their most lowest point in need. That is the time that they come and encounter God. This is what Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betsy found out during the time when they were locked in the concentration camp. You see, Corey Ten Boom and her sister uh, had this heart, heart for God and heart for God's special people, the Jewish people. And so during the Nazi war, during the time of Hitler, when Nazi was concentrating his efforts in um, arresting and imprisoning all the Jewish people, the Jewish race, and getting rid of them, um, Corrie ten Boom and her family tried to protect them and, and hide the Jewish people, as many, Jewish, uh, as many Jews as they, as they could. But they were discovered, they were found out. The Jews that they were hiding, of course, had to be brought to the concentration camp. They themselves had to be in prison. And Corey and Betsy were placed in a very squalid, very, flea, very much flea-infested uh, prison quarters or prison cells. And what they said was they discovered that it is precisely because God brought them to that flea-infested area for a purpose. And it, because they, that, that particular cell block that they were in was very much flea-infested, the guards wouldn't dare come in. And because the guards wouldn't dare to come in, they were able to hold Bible studies. And the, Corey um, described it this way. She said, Either Betsy or I would open the Bible because only the Hollanders could understand the Dutch text. We would translate aloud in German, and then we would hear the life-giving words pass back along the aisles in French, in Polish, in Russian, Czech, and back into Dutch. They were like little previews of heaven, these evenings beneath the light bulb. And what Corey was saying at that point was, the beauty of it is because the guards would not dare go in, they were able to hold these Bible studies. And people from, from a lot of, from different nations and tongue were able to hear the good news of Christ being passed on. Corey's sister, Betsy, would eventually, would eventually die in that place. But before she died, she spoke to her sister, Corey, and said these words. These were her dying words. She said, we must tell them what we've learned here. We must tell them that there's no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. They'll listen to us, Corey, because we have been here. Let me repeat that statement. We must tell them that there's no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. They found God at the deepest point, at the deepest pit, where a lot of people, not just them, but a lot of people heard the good news of Christ. What about you? Are you at a pit right now? There are a lot of people who feel that they are at the pit in their lives. This whole pandemic has brought them to that point. And it feels like there's no hope beyond this 2020 for a lot of people. But I tell you that you can find the Lord or God can meet you right there in the very pit that you are in. Now, if you were Gideon and you were told about these things, what would, you, what would be in your heart? If you, after you've shared uh, to the angel this concern that you feel that the Lord has abandoned you. Probably if I were Gideon, I would expect the Lord to say, don't worry about it, Gideon. I have prepared a mighty army that would defend my people, attack those Midianites and Malachites. 
Well, God was indeed preparing an army. But the thing is this. He said in verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength that you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? All this time, God was calling and preparing Gideon to be his hero, to be the leader, to be the judge among the people. And then, of course, Gideon blurted out and said in verse 15, but, but Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. And so Gideon was saying at that point, he was saying, Lord, how could you use me? You, might have, you, you must have had the wrong person. I mean, I'm from the weakest tribe of Manasseh in, in all Israel. Then my family was the lowest and weakest family in the tribe of Man Manasseh. And further, he was the lowest and weakest member of his family. So in effect, he was the lowest and weakest member of the lowest and weakest family of the lowest and weakest tribe in all of Israel. You cannot go weaker or lower than that. And so he's trying to excuse himself and giving this excuse to the Lord. Gideon doubted God's ability to use him. He said, how can you use little old me? There are people far greater who come from a greater tribe than us. Choose them, right? You might say the same thing. As I look at my life, I realize I'm not big. I've never be, be famous or influential. I don't have the clout of people to influence. And I'm just simple old me. How could you use me? And so that leads us to the second point, that God meets us in the midst of our weaknesses. Could that happen now? Yes, in the midst of our weaknesses, we could find God. We find that He is all that is. He's more than enough. Right? The battle is the Lord's. Right? It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Hudson Taylor said this, All of God's great men have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on His being with them. They counted on His faithfulness. See, all of God's great men have been weak men who consider the greatness of their God. And that is the bottom line. It's not about how great you are or how big you are. You see, God uses us in, the, in, in our weaknesses so that He could display His glory, right? His strength is made perfect in our weaknesses. God who often uses and chooses the most unlikely person, the youngest guy in the poorest family in this most unknown town at the bottom of the well. And He could use that person to bring about the gospel. He used shepherds as the first missionaries in the first place, right? He used a Samaritan woman to win a whole town. When Hudson Taylor first arrived in Shanghai, China in the mid-1800s, missionaries often viewed him as a poor, unconnected nobody, that he would not make it as a missionary. But then he proved them wrong. He proved them wrong. He started what is known as China Inland Mission, 1865. Later on, he was back in Britain. A, lead, a leader of the Church of Scotland asked him and said, you must, Mr. Taylor, you must sometimes be tempted to be proud because of the wonderful way God had used you. I doubt if any man living has had greater honor. And Hudson Taylor answered, on the contrary, I often think that God must have been looking for someone small enough and weak enough for him to use. And he found me. I mean, I personally know that experience, from experience. I came to know the Lord at a very young age, when I was in high school, third year high, and then went to college. And there in college, I felt the calling of God upon my life. But if you knew my background, if you knew how I viewed myself, you wouldn't even think that God could use someone like me. I mean, my, and I've said this before, I think, I often describe myself during high school when, uh, as, a, as a man who, as a young man who had um, a, an inferiority as high as the roof and a sense of self-worth as low as ever, anybody can. So I have a very, very low sense of self-esteem, a very, very high sense of insecurity, and those are my extremes. And yet I'm standing here speaking before you using this pulpit. Not because this is me, but I'm simply an instrument for God to use to reveal His glory. And that should be our attitude every time that we see that God is simply using us to display forth His glory and His honor. It's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about Him. But God could display His perfect glory and strength in spite of our weakness. Moses asked, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Jeremiah said, I'm young, I cannot speak. And notice their emphasis. Gideon was saying, how can I? Moses was saying, who am I? 
And Jeremiah was saying, definitely not I. And they were right on their own. On their own, they couldn't do it. But God said to Gideon, surely I'll be with you. To Moses, God said, I will be with you. To Jeremiah, he said, I am with you to deliver you. To Joseph, the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. To Joshua, he said, be strong and be of good courage, for the Lord will be with you wherever you go. In the New Testament, to the apostles, he said, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. To us, he promises, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Right? If God be for us, who can be against us? God's promise to Gideon, <coughs> surely I'll be with you, meant that he needed to be courageous because he will be used by God to smite the Midianite army. Not by his own strength, but by the strength that God provides. And that is the same promise that he gives to us. Regardless of how weak you may see yourself, that's precisely a better attitude because we realize that we are utterly dependent upon Him. And thirdly, God meets us at the heart of our worship. If you look at verses 17 to 24, there you find the story of Gideon, um, you know, asking God for a sign. And then God honored that just so that Gideon would have this peace of mind that God was actually the one calling him. We might wonder why Gideon asked for further confirmation. Give me a sign that's really you talking to me. And the Lord responded positively. He did not take it as a lack of faith or anything. This is an indication of grace at work in the life of Gideon. The Lord recognizes Gideon's need is for worship and for waiting. And he asked the Lord to wait, so he begins his preparation for worship. Now you could just imagine the thoughts going through his mind as he was preparing the sacrifice. Earlier, I was hiding in fear, cowering in fear, threshing wheat in a wine press. And lo and behold, I'm preparing this sacrifice as a sign from the Lord that He is really calling me to lead His people against the enemy. Is this really happening? This is not something you do in your own strength. This can only happen for the Lord. But the passage closes with God touching Gideon's sacrifice with consuming fire. And in the demonstration of His power, Gideon falls to his knees, overwhelmed with awe in the presence of a holy, majestic God. It's rightly been observed that the sense of wonder and awe is almost completely lost on us today. As the writer Annie Dillard says, we have lost the capacity for awe instead of turned to look for wonder and thrill in technology which doesn't satisfy our hunger or our thirst. We have seemed to lo lose that sense of awe and wonder which is evident in the Psalms of David. I wonder if that is true of us. Have we lost that sense of awe that Andler was talking about? That even in the midst of being going through online service, have we lost a sense of awe and wonder of who God is? I mean, it's so, sometimes we feel it's so artificial. It's so different, worshiping the Lord in the privacy of our homes, in our living rooms, without the stimulus of having a live band in front of us, without other, worship, other brothers and sisters in Christ with us in the faith, without a, a, a preacher, a live preacher preaching to us. We're just there looking at the monitor of our screens and of our TV sets, and it feels so artificial. And it's difficult to, re, to bring back that sense of awe of who God is. But I believe it all the more that we need to bring that sense of wonder and awe of who He is, even in the midst of our unique worship that we are in right now, this online worship. Yes, God says, where two or three are gathered, He is in our midst. He did say that where He is is holy ground. And I believe that right now at this point in time that you've dedicated your rooms, your places, your house to be a house of worship. That is where the Lord is. And brothers and sisters, it's important for us to restore that sense of awe of the majesty and glory of God. Because if we start to lose that sense of the greatness of God in our lives, He becomes too small and our troubles and our problems become magnified as if it's like a worldwide pandemic. And so we're unable to cope up and face up with the pressures in our life. And we believe in the lies that Satan throws at us. But now we have to restore that sense of all of who He is. And in the midst of the worship that Gideon gives to the Lord, of the sacrifice that he gives. What is interesting there 
is that when the Gideon, verse 22 of Judges 6, when Gideon realized it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. Jehovah Shalom. Think about this. This altar is sort of like an altar of commitment on the part of Gideon. It's an altar of worship, but at the same time, an altar of commitment that he is committing himself to what God wants him to, for what God has commissioned him to do and to lead his people against the Midianites. So he'll be facing wars and battles left and right. But in the midst of that battle, he is saying, the Lord is my peace, Jehovah Shalom. You see, we look at peace as the absence of strife and conflict or everything is serene. That's peace for us. But in the Bible, it talks, when it talks about peace, it doesn't mean the absence of conflict. It simply means the deep-rooted tranquility of order in the midst of trouble. That in the midst of this pandemic, we can have peace. In the midst of a financial crisis, you can have peace. In the midst of health crisis, you can have the peace of God because you know that God is in control. You know that God can use you in the midst of your weaknesses. You know that God can meet you in the center of your woes. Jesus said this himself, these things I've spoken to you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have trouble or tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Jesus says prior to his going to the cross, he promises disciples, in me you will have peace at a time when he was about to give his life and surrender and give, his, give up his life to, on the cross. He says, in me you will have peace. But note that he said, he did not promise them a bed of roses. Instead, he was true to them and says, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Jesus is not only promising us peace, the Bible says he is the Prince of Peace. And in Ephesians, Paul says this, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility. He is our peace, Jesus himself. And so, brothers and sisters, we need to understand that if you and I want to have that sense of peace in our lives, we can only find it in the person of Jesus Christ. And if you have Christ in your life, even in the midst of this pandemic, even in the midst of the crisis that you, are, you might be facing, Regardless of what it is, if you have Christ, then you have what? Peace. In me, you will have peace. He himself is our peace. Gideon needed to understand who he was, but more importantly, he needed the personal encounter with God. Napoleon's soldiers used to say, when Napoleon takes our hands and look at us, we feel like conquerors. You know what? When God takes us by the hand, when Jesus takes us by the hand, we don't just feel like conquerors. We are more than conquerors through Christ. That's what the Bible says. You don't just feel like it, you are one. In fact, the Bible says you are more than, we are more than conquerors through Christ. And so even in the face of all this, we can say with all sincerity, we are more than conquerors because Christ is our peace. So let us review. God meets us at the center of our woes and he promises us his presence. God meets us in the midst of our weaknesses and he strengthens us with his power. God meets us at the heart of our worship and he gives us his peace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the word that you've given us this morning. Yes, Lord, in the midst of this pandemic, even as this quarantine has taken its toll on a lot of people, a lot of businesses, a lot of lives, Lord, we still trust that you are in control. And yes, Lord, we declare, just like what Gideon encountered with you, that you meet us at the center of our woes, and there you promise us your presence, which is more than enough. And yes, you meet us in the midst of our weaknesses because your power is made perfect in our weaknesses. And yes, you meet us at the heart of our worship, not just in church, but wherever we may be. 
we can worship you freely. And at the heart of our worship, you give us and you grant us your peace through your son, Jesus Christ. And we give you thanks and praise in Je and in his name, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's continue to be an action of worship as we come before the Lord and observe communion. Indeed, the Lord is our peace. He has broken down every wall of hostility. And because of his broken body and blood for us, we are restored to a peace relationship with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read a few portions of scripture as we prepare. Jesus himself said, now as they were eating, he took off the bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took off the cup when given thanks. He said, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I'll not drink it again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it with you with you in my father's kingdom. You know, brothers and sisters, communion is a time not only for us to remember what he did on the cross 2,000 years ago, but it looks forward to the time when we will be having this marriage supper of the Lamb, where we will spend eternity with the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. As we prepare to come to Lord's table, we should recognize it as a time of celebration, as also a time of reflection. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, whoever therefore eats of the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let us therefore, let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Why don't we give ourselves a minute to just come before the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. If there's any sin in our life, then let's ask the Lord to cleanse us, forgive us, that we may be worthy to partake of the bread and of the cup. Let us pray. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took off the bread, when given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us all partake of the bread. In the same way, he also took off the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us all partake of the cup. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that even in the privacy of our own homes, we could observe communion. And in spirit, we share this time and this moment together with our brothers and sisters in Christ in their respective places. We are made one through Jesus Christ. And He Himself is our peace who has broken down every wall of hostility and restored us to a peace relationship with the Father through His death and resurrection. And so, Lord, we want to give you thanks and praise for this wonderful opportunity that you give us as a reminder of what he has done 2,000 years ago 
and as a reminder of what we will experience soon and very soon when you come again to take us with you for all eternity in that wedding supper of the Lamb. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. It's now our tithes and offering time. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 8 says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us cheerfully do so either through depositing to our BDO account or our new GCash account. Let's pray. Father God, bless the offerings we, we give. May this be used to expand your kingdom and share your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Also, we would like to invite everyone to join our weekly prayer meeting. It's on every Wednesday, 8 p.m. So if you have any prayer concerns, thanksgiving, or requests, we would like to pray for you. Second, even with social distancing, we should not distance ourselves spiritually. So we encourage, encourage everyone to join a small group. Also, let us get connected through our church Instagram account and Facebook account. Lastly, every one of us has a story to tell. If you have any testimonies to share, we would like to hear from it. You might be touching or inspiring others' lives with it. Let us now receive the benediction. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Shalom, everyone. The Lord bless you and keep you, make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. Have a great day and blessed week ahead. God bless.